Hello and welcome to the FinTech Finance Virtual Arena. I'm your host, Doug McKenzie, and on today's very special session, we are going to be looking at digital payments around the world, but more specifically, within India. Digital payments around the world have become increasingly prevalent around the world over the last 19 or so months. But some countries have just adopted the movement far quicker than others. So today we're going to find out about India's payments scene. And joining me in this discussion is none other than Rudiger Vogt from Giska and Devran. Rudiger, how are you doing here today? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Amazing. Now, Rudiger, for our audience who not, might not be aware, could you tell us a bit more about uh, your role and also your organization, Geese Endeavor or GND, please? Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation, Doug, and I'm very happy to talk with you and Avik about the rapid development of the Indian digital payments ecosystem and the future of fintechs. So my name is Rüdiger Vogt and I'm in charge uh, of Gizek Endeavorians or GND's business with fintechs, neobanks and aggregators. At GND, we engineer trust to secure everyday life and payment connectivity for identities and digital infrastructures. And GND is a leading player in the paytech space from physical payments to innovative customer focused digital payment and also authentication solutions. So very excited to talk about India. Uh, as Prime Minister Narendra Modi said, the world's economic revival is linked to the growth of India. And I think we can all agree to that. So for GND, India is one of the most dynamic and exciting markets. And we're active in India for many years now with R&D and production centers serving banks and fintech customers. That's absolutely incredible. And I mean, what powerful words to, to kick the uh, the introduction off. So thank you, Rudiger. And also joining us, we have Avik Chowdhury. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, could you, uh, well, I've got to first ask how you're doing and, and also if you could give our audience a bit of background to yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Avik. I take care of digital innovations across digital lending, payments, banking, I've been in the space for more than 12 years, worked across the entire length and breadth in the digital business space. Uh, what I primarily do is I build products and bring innovations and I scale businesses across these digital business lines or product lines. Incredible. I mean, that that insight is going to be so critical for obviously for today's session. So, Avik, thank you once again. Now, to kick things off, then, um, I, I think, Avik, it's best to kind of start with you on this. And can you tell us and our audience a bit more about India's incredible adoption of digital payments? Sure. So, uh, you know, the fintech boom has already been there. I mean, uh, over the last a decade, there has been a fintech boom in India. And we have seen that this boom is in a way responsible for what is happening today. Now, one of the key things to understand is while, you know, the digital payments, because I'm particularly focusing on that, has had been there earlier, but uh, it was never that in that scale adopted or in that scale, it was never, you know, it never scaled up. What happened is that first was demonetization by our Prime Minister Narendra Modi that gave the first impetus, I would say, to the mass scale adoption and acceleration in adoption. Also, the companies, banks, organizations started working more towards not only building products and capabilities and journeys for payments, but also developing the core infrastructure, which is actually needed before we can accept those payments. Similarly, when COVID came, it also brought about a certain vacuum in the market. There were no way, you know, uh, people were able to go outside, buy things and all, and people were afraid to touch. So that was when contactless payments started scaling up and we were able to actually capture the space. So now what we are looking at the space, also we should remember that, you know, this all this has really been possible because of the a very new breed of customers have come up who are very, very tech savvy, who are looking for great experiences across whatever they do, be it payments, be it lending. And not to mention, of course, the availability and the penetration of smartphones into the nooks and corners of the country, the affordability in, you know, data, and also the uh, greater outreach of mobile networks in a country like India. All these, in fact, have given an impetus to the entire uh, digital payments ecosystem as we see today. I have not mentioned, but I should, about the government's initiatives and policies. That is one of the key backbone on which this entire space has opened up or shaped up. 
Yeah, and I, I think we are going to come on to that in, in strong words, but already from the introduction of the first question, we're already hearing, um, you know, the power of, of, of the Indian government and, and obviously Modi um, from, from uh, past incidences, how much that's been an impact. But before we move on to the governmental impact, Rudiger, I'm also interested to hear your perspective from, from Gieska and Devon, obviously so firmly in payments, you know, how you've seen the adoption as well. And if there's anything you can add to Avik's commentary there. Yeah, well, of course, the, the numbers are clear, right? India leads the, the real-time payments market and has long passed China and South Korea, even with, with more than 25 billion transactions last year. Wow. And the digital payments industry in India is expected to grow to more than 300% of its current size by 2025. So it's 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 an enormous growth there. And apart from the um, from the from the technological enablement and then also the the, the government initiatives initiatives that we're going to talk about, I think that the, the user experience is very important, right? So, of course, e-payments are faster. They don't have constraints on time and locations. And uh, meanwhile, sophisticated security measures such as tokenization are applied. So with digital payment, the, the possibility of human error is minimized and you have full transparency and documentation of the process. So there's a lot of advantages also from, from that perspective. Yeah. Now, it does seem to almost be this just this, this discussion of all these exciting innovations that, that are fueling it. But as we have brought up, um, there is obviously uh, Modi's influence, government's influence, and also central bank's influences. So, Rudiger, how much of this is being fueled by the government? We've already stated probably quite a bit, but you know, can, can you divulge that further? Yeah, the, the, the government of India, so if you look at the, the uh, fintech perspective, the government of India has established a regulatory environment and, and encouraged the foundation of fintechs. As a result, we've seen an increase in the investment and funding by both international and national banks, as well as an influx of, of venture capital. So to boost in, uh, technology innovation, the government of India has then also launched yeah. initiatives driven by the National Payments Council of India, NPCI, uh, the Digital India Program and Financial Inclusion Programs. And just to give you one more example for, for government action, since uh, Abik, I, I understand, is a, is a lending expert, um, banks, uh, NBFCs, so non-bank finance companies and fintechs are now entering into partnerships for the co-origination of, of loans, jointly financing loans and sharing credit risks. And the Reserve Bank of India has advocated this model as a solution to address the credit gap in the priority sector. So that's agriculture, for example, or small scale industries that otherwise might not get timely and adequate credit. So there's a lot of influence, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, good things coming from the, from the government initiatives. And it's driving uh, both the, 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 the um, the, the growth of the fintech uh, segment, as well as the uh, as, as the um, digital or electronic payment um, initiatives. Yeah, it does seem to be in tandem because once you offer up those financial services like lending, it, it just opens up so many corridors for people to get involved in finance. And it does sound, as you were saying, the government is right at the heart of enabling people to get access to finance. And, and Avik, would you, would you chime in as well and agree with Rudiger in the fact that there seems to be this concerted push to enable people to get access to finance and that's kind of knocking on everything else behind it yeah so i think i'm very much in line with what rudiger said uh it's uh, really clear that see in, in any country okay uh, you cannot push something unless and until you have an infrastructure especially in an industry like banking which is highly regulated now, in India, while it has been highly regulated, it's also true that the government and also the Reserve Bank has been extremely forward thinking when it comes to introducing innovative ways to do banking and also leveraging, you know, I would say leveraging great policies to ensure that the customer's life is, you know, hassle free. So in order to but, and that actually has been the basis or I will say the bedrock upon which we all have built. Also, it must be mentioned that when, a when in such an ecosystem, it is not only that they do something. There are also a lot of problems to solve, which fintechs, banks, and not banks, I will say per se, but fintechs exactly are solving. This actually opens up a lot of ideas, gives a lot of understanding to the people who are there that no there are things which need to move in a certain direction if we are to solve those problems and that's when they're taken up yeah. so and that is how it has happened and reserve bank as 
um, which is really being powered by payments at the end of the day. So what role is, is technology going to play in that? And what role um, I'm really interested is in, in terms of payment tokenization going to play as well? Right. So, so let's let's first talk a bit about the technology. Typically, when you're doing an e-commerce transaction, you have to enter your credit or debit card information. Now, tokenization refers to the replacement of those card details with an alternative code called a token, which is unique for a combination of card token uh, requester and the and the device that you're using. Uh, and the token requester is the entity that accepts a request from the customer for tokenization of a card and passes it on to the card network to issue then the token. So in essence, a token is an anonymized set of characters against the original payment credential. If you repeatedly shop online at the same place, you might want to have your payment credentials stored so you do not have to enter them every time you buy something. This process is known as card on file. And this convenient way of shopping calls, of course, for highly secure processes to store and use the credentials, of course. And in this case, card on file tokenization adds this additional layer of security. So we think that in uh, 2022, so next year, card on file tokenization is becoming a dominant payment method, really, with 95% of e-commerce uh, payments uh, predicted to be uh, tokenized. So now talking about the situation in, in India, the Reserve Bank of India has recently changed tokenization guidelines due to which online stores can no longer store actual card data. And the mandate is as follows with effect from 1st January next year, no entity in the card transaction or payment chain other than the card issuers uh, and or card networks will be able to store the actual card data. Any such data stored previously will be purged. So that means even if online platforms use tokenization today, the card on file tokenization must then be provided by a network or issuer based solution. And merchants will simply receive the anonymized set of characters, the token from a token provider and store it in their database. So that's a huge increase in, in the security level and it's really a game changer. Yeah, it just sounds like uh, it's finally consumers getting control of their data again, finally, and also getting control of the e-commerce industry, which has exploded across the world to the point where actually we need to have a reevaluation of where our, our payment data lies. We need to have that conversation. And it seems like um, you know, we're moving in that direction. Now, um, with that in mind then, Avik, consumers don't really want to think about payment. Uh, ultimately, you know, we've seen in e-commerce, you, you don't eat, that's the worst part of the experience. But despite this, what will tokenization provide the consumer when it comes to this, this burgeoning e-commerce industry? So in India, Google Pay was one of the first players to introduce tokenization. So that was, uh, that was the first step, I think, so a tech player took towards, you know, tokenizing payments. And I think uh, the, uh, the experience that you have while playing, you know, while paying with a card over Google Pay is awesome. So I think tokenization will be a major driver when it comes to driving subscription based uh, products or services for consumers. And I think we will see as Rodiger rightly mentioned that more than 80 to 90% of the players over the next year will definitely adopt this model because otherwise it will be a, uh, how do I say, it will really affect the inflows, the subscription inflows that have been predicted earlier by them. Yeah. Now that's an interesting point because, you know, there I was saying that, you know, you don't want to think about a payment, but ultimately suddenly when you're faced with a, a fraudulent payment, um, suddenly you very much do think of the payment experience um, and it is front of mind. So I think you're completely right there. So uh, Rudiger, with that in mind, how has fraud evolved in the last 19 months or so? And do you think tokenization, you know, do you agree with Avik there that tokenization is going to help reduce that monumental issue? I think some countries have issued it as a national uh, emergency when it comes to fraud. Mm -hmm. Before I come to the fraud question, just uh, mm. to, to add to what, what Avik has just said, I mean, th there's of course several advantages uh, besides the, the added security and, and the fact that it's it's building trust with, with tokenization. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about is actually the advantage of automatic token refresh that makes it so more so much more convenient with your card on file transactions. 
It, it takes place at card renewal when a card is stolen, lost or expires with no interaction, interruption to scheduled payments and no discontinu discontinuation of the service. So it means there is no need for a consumer to log into an online shopping account to update their details or to miss out on a subscription due to redundant card credentials. This is now possible with, with the tokenization process and a major improvement for the, uh, for the consumer. And um, finally, you can also combine card and file tokenization and uh, strong customer authentication. And that means that the customer experience will then even be more satisfying at the checkout. Because if strong customer uh, authentication is already done when the consumer is logging into the merchant's app, the issuer can then rely on that authentication and it will not ask again for processing and making the process, uh, the payment process then seamless. So just, just to add to that, so that there's even, uh, in addition to the security aspect, there, there's convenience aspects. Now, um, talking about the, uh, how has fraud evolved? Um, unfortunately, I do not have any statistics on this for the, for the whole country. Um, but just to give you an example, what I found is that for Delhi, the local police have received over uh, 4,500 cybercrime uh, complaints during the first lockdown period between April and, and July 2020 alone. And of these complaints, 62% were related to online financial fraud. And I think it's a safe assumption that with the e-commerce boom, online fraud went up as well across India. But the measures we outlined earlier will have a positive impact. I'm confident that we will see a significant reduction in e-commerce fraud in 2022 based on the changes the RBI is, is mandating. And clearly, India is headed towards a cashless economy and the Reserve Bank of India is ensuring maximum digital security with this timely legislation. So at GND, we are currently reaching out to schemes and large banks to understand their views and impact it may have on the market landscape and our solution offering. And I think while device-based uh, tokenization, for example, for wearables, will have its own adoption curve, network tokenization is, is to become really a mainstream technology to secure e-commerce transactions from 1st of January onwards, exactly like, like Avik said as well. So as India is becoming more digitalized, success depends really on the country's ability to prevent uh, fraud and, and protect consumer information. Yeah. Uh, and that almost is that like convergence again that we, we've been talking about earlier in the conversation is it's this joint effort to, of, oh to please. add on yeah. what uh, Rodrigo said uh, I have a bit of data that I have we had you know as a part of our uh, evaluation program and we found that uh, in the last uh, over the last two years there have been more than uh, 8,000 cases of uh, various different frauds uh, but the more interesting part is it cumulatively gives a figure of somewhere more than 40 million if I talk about the frauds and the amount that has, you know, actually taken place. Yeah. So for, I think more than worth 40 million US dollars of fraud has happened only uh, over around these 8,000 cases, which is, uh, uh, which is a huge one. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a huge amount. And you can see why um, nations nation states and also the financial institutions are are finally almost communicating on a scale that has never really been seen before but to, to the help. reason but the reason is always not that there is some issue with security okay sometimes it also is because in my opinion the payment space has been evolving so fast yeah. so fast that it is not always possible for a common person to keep track of it. So as a result, I think it is more a case of lack of financial literacy, okay? That has happened over here. So of the frauds, a lot of, I agree that a lot of percentage can be attributed to security issues, but I think also a bigger percentage can also be attributed to lack of literacy when it comes to digital financial transactions. Yeah. And, but I, I think you're, you're completely right on both accounts in the fact that it, it's been a general change in payment culture, even for the institutions. And uh, you know, when you think of the all the people all the way down to small, medium enterprises and individuals, we're all having to work together on that to, to improve it. And as you said, payments have evolved and, and some of the innovations we've heard already on this conversation just highlight that. How much has changed in the last 18 months you could expect to see that change in finance and payments over the previous 10, 15 years. And that's all been condensed in, into nearly two years. So I think it, it's a, a joint combination of uh, vectors that are coming together and hopefully going to work towards helping that. Now, 
you know, working towards that that new future then, Avik, what are your predictions for the future of e-commerce in India? What role, for instance, will marketplaces, uh, digital marketplaces play going forward? All right. See, I think uh, I will answer this question in, you know, there are two legs to this question, actually. Yeah. I will take two of them. So when it comes to the future of e-commerce and also how marketplaces behave, I think we are living in an age which is a, of a marketplace economy, actually. Uh, API and a marketplace economy. Today, marketplaces will reign more than any individual players. So if you look at financial institutions or even small or large fintech players, all are trying to be part of a marketplace or rather they are trying to convert themselves into a marketplace. The chances or I will say the uh, probability of me getting or you know earning is much more in a marketplace model than on a single and individual proprietorship platform model. So I think that marketplace will drive the growth forward for any type of transactions or any type of product or businesses, be it retail, be it SME, or be it large scale manufacturing. There are already market uh, firms which have turned themselves into marketplaces. There are fintechs who are working on that and have become that. Now coming to your second leg, what will happen to e-commerce and how the shape will how will this shape up? I think e-commerce is now this a very interesting place, especially when it has become a you know a ecosystem where payments and lending are crisscrossing each other. So now e-commerce is a space where you not only pay but also you have the option to take a loan and pay take a short term loan and pay or use a buy now pay later model which is a quasi loan in my opinion it's not neither a full payment or it's neither a full loan it's in my opinion a quasi loan you get a loan for maybe a few days so and i know we know that there are much many types of buy now pay later models but the most prevalent one is that you take it for 10 to 12 days or 14 days and you pay it back now, this is a very interesting space because a multiple business models open up and also it gives the opportunity to multiple players to actually come in and, you know, get themselves embedded in such a way that it becomes a key component of a consumer's life cycle. And then you slowly take that consumer ahead and you bring it into your own fold. So I think this is a very, very interesting place, which all players, banks, fintechs are trying to capture. Everyone is now, in a way, part of the BNPL ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, it really has revolutionized, not just lending uh, for obvious reasons, but really how people view um, well, e-commerce again, for obvious reasons, but payments exactly. in general. It's it's really changed the, the nature of how, uh, again, going back to payments culture, how people view a payment and also Rudiger, i'm really interested in your perspective as well if we you know continue just this narrow focus of e-commerce in india you know how will that change going forward yeah so um just to add to 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 what uh, Vic has rightly mentioned uh definitely by now pay later is is a is a major accelerator for for the growth we're, we're seeing so um just to, to give you some numbers 110 billion us dollars is the estimated size of the uh, of the e-commerce market in 2025 in india coming from less than 50 billion last year so and i think this might even be a conservative uh, assumption um, and of course, this is being uh, then uh, driven by the uh, by the smartphone penetration, reaching more than 780 million internet connections currently. So it's it's just tremendous numbers there. Um, of course, e-commerce progress and um, and development doesn't stop with buy now pay later. Um, what uh, apart from the from the payment um, side, I think we're also seeing a constant enhance, enhancement of the user experience as a whole with with daily. Um, or same day delivery, omni-channel and, and digital services with personalized marketing and, and more and more subscription-based business models. And then of course, the, the social distancing and shutdown of brick and mortar shops that has driven consumers to online uh, channels, uh, even for their day-to-day -day purchases. And that has then 
uh, driven the, um, the the growth of uh, e-commerce marketplaces like uh, Flipkart, Amazon, and Big Basket in India. Um, the digital marketplaces are, are opening really new possibilities. For example, they allow a business owner to extend the product portfolio and customer reach with limited or no additional inventory risk. Um, on the other hand, uh, what I see is, is there's also the power of the marketplace operator that needs to be considered, right? So they are in control of which brands uh, they are onboarding and they also set the rules. So I think this might also then need to come with, with more regulation uh, going forward. Yeah, and again, we're seeing this combined effort um, between now, a th- you know, we're bringing up this third element is that, that change in perceptions and change in culture when it comes to payments. Um, and I love that, that you know, bringing up the subscription model side of things as well. Um, it just shows that our, our version of how we, we pay for things is not only being changed by the technology that's been provided, but also, again, going back to that, that customer experience. And then Rudiger, if I, um, if I could stick with you then, um, and we're going to open up this question now um, and and kind of look at the payment scene in general. Um, obviously, Keith and Devon right at the heart of payments. I'm really interested to see your predictions, Rudiger, for the payment scene in general in India going forward into the 2020s. Mm-hmm. I, I think there, there's, of course, it, it, that, that's a very broad field. But um, <clears throat> since we've already talked about the, the digital solutions, um, uh, let me just highlight two more uh, two more trends that I see in the in the, the project, projects that we're currently working on. So one is is wearable technology. It's on the rise globally, but especially in India. So there's uh, startups that combine, for example, health tracking devices and contactless payment technology. We're working together with with one of the rising stars in India in this field, and uh, they're offering us a smart preventive health ecosystem. And that combines a fitness tracker, an app, uh, and a care team even in the background to help you meet your health strategies. Wow. And uh, GND is is bringing the mobile payment solution to this ecosystem, and it will be secured by our tokenization uh, technology. So that's definitely one trend that, that we're seeing and one uh, project that, that we're working on. The, the other important long-term trend I see is the focus on sustainability and eco-innovation. And that's a global trend, but it's also something that we're increasingly seeing uh, talking to the customers in India. So India played a prominent role in the formulation of the UN Sustainable Development Agenda. And much of the, the country's national development agenda is mirrored in the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. And uh, of course, uh, coming back to my initial statement uh, or, or the initial quote that I made, uh, that the, the progress of the world um, to meet the SDGs largely really depends on India's progress. Now, yeah. what does that mean for payment? I can give you an example from my daily work at GND by offering payment cards made from sustainable materials such as plastics pulled from oceans with our partner Parley or plant-based bioplastics we're bringing eco-innovation to the market, helping banks and fintechs to implement their sustainability strategies. And our initiatives span the entire life cycle of a, of a physical payment card, for example, from production and personalization to delivery to users and the activation process all the way to the recycling of the card. And then going beyond that with digital solutions, we're partnering with the economy to uh, uh, enable everyday climate action, lowering the CO2 footprint of clients using the mobile banking app. So I think this this eco trend is really also not only a global trend, but it's also something that we'll increasingly see in India. I mean, that's really exciting hearing all those those innovations and and it kind of you don't almost tie a payment to an eco innovation and then suddenly you hear something like that and you realize oh, you, they, you can actually be helping out in that regard. Um, and, and you know, when you combine that with wearables, that's only going to advance. That's really exciting. Um, and also, Avi, I've got to you know, come to you as well, as well, now that we're, we're opening this up. Uh, Rudiger, uh, throw it over to the, the eco side as well, showing how much this question really is open-ended. Where do you, you, where do you see payment scene in India going forward soon? Okay. I think um, while I agree with Rudiger completely, there are certain points uh, which I think I should put forward. Uh, payments, of course, will be there. It will go, even we will see a lot more traction, a lot more adoption, penetration in the space. We also will see a lot of innovative work being done and a lot of things which we always wanted coming up. For example, uh, interoperability is one of the key things that is important, especially when it comes to uh, wallets. So that space is yet to open up. And I think that is a very interesting space because we would like to see how this pans out over a period of time. 
this may very well change a lot of business models this may very well change a lot of ways in which players may shape up second is we will see a convertibility of products into qr so while qr based payments already do exist but we need to see if it can be and we think we will how products can now be qrized if i can use the word qrized and how customers will react to that uh third i think we have already spoken uh, uh while we have already spoken about the buy now pay later and rudiger has rightly mentioned the wearable you know the wearable ecosystem i think also one more thing what we will see is in the way authentications happen so there will be multiple multi factor authentications there will be biometric authentications there will be end to end encryptions we will see uh, face recognition uh, you know maybe you never know you can see biometric recognition or all these just as a authentication mode for payments and last but not the least uh, i think there are two three more things to consider one of them being that giant tech players actually trying to capture this payment space for example uh, google pay has already started had already started and they are now rapidly pushing adoption we will also see data coming out with their super app now that is a very interesting space to watch about at the same time again we will also see how or maybe cryptocurrencies can be used in this space and the very interesting point is how loyalties can be used as a mode of payment how they can be more uh, commercialized as a form of payment among players i think loyalty is a very very big space and very interesting item that will play a huge role forward in driving the payments ecosystem Uh, I think uh, again we, we're just seeing so many different facets that are, uh, are all coming together at one time um to create probably the most interesting time to be in payments I'm going to hazard a guess and say ever um I I think it's it's just everything is coming together and and it's interesting to see governments actually um as we we kind of started the conversation off looking at the government seeing that impetus and then also touching on the customer demand then the technology and it, having it all to come together is so exciting and and you know with the population over there and and the the prevalence as you said of the mobile phone we're going to see some really exciting innovations now speaking of innovations um are we if i could stick with you for our last question before we wrap up you know can you tell us a bit more about what what's next for us? all right i think uh, uh of all the innovations that i have mentioned a lot of work has already started i think now we are looking at using merchant acquiring or pos as one of the key uh, you know as one of the key infrastructure on which we will not only build or further grow our payments business but also we uh, will grow our lending business so that is somewhere that we are planning also i think one of the most important part is that we are bringing in a lot of innovations in the payment space as far as merchant payments are concerned i think b2c payments and b2b payments i think b2b payments is going to again be revolutionized this is a place which is still uh, you know uh, which is which which has a lot of potential but has not been focused on much i think we we would like to work on that yeah I think we're going to see huge changes to the way acquiring banks and and processing banks uh continue. Now, thank you so much Avi for uh for your input today, but also Rudiger, we've got to find out, you know, you've you've told us some some incredible innovations that you you've been working on personally, but what's next for Geesker and Devrin? Yeah, I mean, especially talking now about the India perspective, of, of course we we've seen that India has leapfrog when when it comes to to adopting digital payments and um with support from the government and and the regulator um paying via your phone or buying online that, that that's all going to become mainstream mm. now for for gnd of course this brings huge opportunities and uh 
We aim to be at the start of every transaction, as, as we say. For, for that, we, we really keep investing and especially increasing our activity in digital solutions, such as tokenized payment. And our development center in India has established uh, was established in, in uh, 2006 in Pune, and it's now become our largest global R&D center, just to, to show you the dimension of things with, with more than 300 professionals working there. And um, GND India has been the partner for major banks moving from the magnetic stripe to chip card uh, based credit cards longer time ago, uh, served out of our personalization bureau in Chennai. And uh, what we're seeing now is, is of course, then the move from the from the physical card to digital services, be it host card emulation or, or wearables, exactly as I mentioned before. And we're expanding our business with banks and payment institutions. And we're now also entering into the fintech space more and more with the first project. So stay tuned for the next announcements uh, coming soon. Uh, I think within the next couple of months, this will be an even more exciting place for us. Yeah, I mean, it's just exponentially innovating. So it's absolutely brilliant to hear from both of you, just having your guys' expertise um, and, and, and insights. It's been absolutely fascinating. So I just want to say a big thank you. And also a big thanks to our audience. You can catch the rest of the series and much more over at ffnews.com and of course YouTube, but especially LinkedIn, where you'll see me in the comments. So Avik, Rudiger, thank you once again and have a lovely day. Goodbye.